I think I'm live. Perfect. It's been a long time since I've done one of these, so thanks for the couple people that have tuned in. Hopefully some more people tune in as the, uh, the thing happens. We're going to see how it goes. I thought um, I have some new stuff coming out soon, so I thought now would be a good time to test to make sure uh, all my stuff is still working and I have all the settings set up and everything works so that when I do this for real, um, I'm not going to have to worry about it. So let me know if you can hear me. Let me know if you can hear the synth, if it looks okay, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Hi guys, hi guys. So today, um, what we're going to do is sort of just talk through, I have a patch going here, I built it up this afternoon, and we're just going to kind of talk through what it is and talk a little bit about the modules that I used and and what, uh, what we kind of have in store for the future here. Uh, it's been so long since I've done this, I haven't really given any updates on Pittsburgh Modular or anything like that. So I thought tonight would be a good time for all that stuff. So for the four people watching right now, and uh, for anybody that tunes in later on, let's uh, dig in. Oh, by the way, if you obviously if you have any questions, just throw them in the live chat, and I will try to answer them. So the, the patch we have going on right now is just a, a little bit of a baseline. It's... it's the baseline is coming from Captain Bigo. I have a saw wave coming out of there, going into the filter of crows, which is uh, the latest implementation of the Pittsburgh filter. That is then going into the dynamic controller bat, which is the dynamics controller from the voltage lab, almost. Uh, resistor for resistor. It's a clone of our own circuit, I suppose. And that goes into the mixer, and that's what we're listening to right now. There is a little bit of reverb on things, because um, I like reverb. The reverbs we're using tonight, we have two. Uh, we're using the Alesis MIDI Verb 2 and the Alesis MIDI Verb 3. I have one on the bus and one on the aux end, so thought I would go for a real sort of a dark one and then a cleaner one up top for the percussion stuff. So that's this first, uh, that's the baseline, I guess, for this patch. Um, we can do a little bit of a kick drum now. There's a nice kick sound. The kick sound is actually uh, being triggered with these, the first snakes here. It's the first channel on the snakes, channel A. That is triggering the llama kick drum. So this module, not out yet. I still have the acrylic and paper panel on it. Uh, the panels hopefully ship tonight and uh, we'll be sh we'll be selling these next week I hope so um, but I can talk about it a little bit I plan on doing a live stream next week to talk about this exclusively um, when they are available to order nothing's available to order yet today but they do make sound and we can talk about them and they are the kick in the snare will be they will be uh, available next week so so we can talk about the top knob here it's called vibration um, with these drum modules what we've tried to do is kind of emulate the sounds of real drum kits and how they produce sound so there wasn't necessary all necessarily always an analog in 
uh, modular synthesis terms or analog synthesis terms to describe what a knob is doing. So we thought it would be fun to name the knobs after what they're supposed to represent in the real world. So if this was an actual kick drum, uh, we decided to name things for what it would do to the actual kick drum. Now, um, is that does that make the most sense to the end user? I don't know. We thought it was kind of fun. So, <laughs> hi, Yotus. Welcome. I, I've been busy. I've been real busy. But I'm back tonight. And so let's, let's enjoy it while we have it. Uh, so anyway, the top knob, vibration. This is going to allow you to do your tuning of the drum. And it also sets this sort of... Uh, Variation. So at the lower levels, what you're going to do is with every kick, you're, it's going to sound a little bit different. Kind of like if you hit a real kick drum, you know, every time you kick it, you're going to get a little bit of a different vibe out of it. So that's, that's where that is. And then higher up, it does give you sort of a tuned kick drum sound. The next knob down, the small knob here is the beater. And we like to think of this as the, uh, the actual beater that's hitting the drum head. This knob is changing the material that that's made out of. So you can go nice and soft all the way to super sharp. And then tension is going to change the tightness of the kick head. And we can't get into sort of obviously not a real kick drum sound, but there's lots of nice little areas here. Now the this drum is interesting to me for a couple reasons. One being that it's not a clone of anything. Uh, we really started from scratch with these and thought, well, what do we want a drum to sound like? How do we want to achieve that? Um, there's already a million 808 and 909 clones out there, and they all sound really good. Um, but they all sound like an 808 and a 909 or a 606. You know, we wanted a drum that sounded like our drum. So we kind of had to start from scratch. And that's what we did. So that's the llama kick, and that's that's playing our kick pattern here. Pretty simple. Um, <laughs> next sound would be the snare. I totally forget where the snare is patched in. Oh, okay, here we go. So the snare drum is the polar bear. It's the polar bear snare. That is patched into my head over here. Move my head over here. There we go. That's patched into this analog delay unit here. Yes. The output of that goes into a uh, new mixer that we have. <laughs> and by new, I mean this is fresh today. This is a 2 plus 2 Occupy mixer. Uh, this is based on the topology of our old 2 plus 2 mixer. But, um, so it does all the, you can break it into two two channel mixers or one four channel mixer. It does all that. But as you can see, it's each channel has a three LED meter, which is awesome. And you also have a mute switch. So in the middle is mute, up is um, unmute and down is inverted and unmute. So that's kind of fun. But that's not it. This mixer, if it was just that, it would be like, well, yeah, sure, mixers are great, but there's a million mixers. But we put a really soft compression saturation circuit in it as well. And now you can turn that on or off if you want to bypass it and you want it to be all clean all the time. Um, why would you get the Occupy if you wanted to do that? So 
you enable this saturation circuit and it just just makes everything sound a little bit beefier, a little bit better. It's all about that sort of uh, laser focused harmonic distortion that we've we've incorporated into a lot of new designs where we're really trying to um, press these sounds and make them sound more analog uh, in a sense. So very, very neat. Um, so that's what we're going to be listening to. The snare is patched into here. Let me see if I can get the snare to make a sound. of effects on it so I can for the moment let's just listen to it dry for a minute so there's our dry snare the snare um, like the llama the polar bear here has we kind of named the knobs after what they represent to a drum so the top is labeled snares and that's the volume control for the snares themselves. So if I turn that down, you just get the head. But I can bring those back in. That's obviously noise. Um, then we have snare tension. We can make it nice and tight. Make it long. And then we have a head control here. And what this is, this is a balance control between the top of the head and the bottom of the head. So if you had a microphone on the top of the snare and a microphone on the bottom of the snare sort of pointing, this allows, this is your balance control between them. The top of the head is gonna be a little bit uh, brighter. And the bottom of the head is a little bit darker. And then you also have a, a separate shaper for the bottom head as well. Why that's kind of interesting is um, you can then CV it or you can hit the bottom head with a separate trigger and hit the bottom of the head independent of the top head and the snares, which is kind of fun if you want an extra percussion sound. Um, you can use that at the same time. I don't have that patched in right now. We'll talk about that again next week. But this snare drum is, again, we were really trying to get the sound of a snare. It, it, I'm not a huge fan of, typically, of analog snare drums. To me, they sound thin, um, a little bit weak. So I wanted a snare drum with a little bit of uh, body to it and a little bit of strength to it. So that's what we've been really working on with this is getting that, that shape together and ha giving it some punch to it. So it's really snappy, but it's not thin and weak like um, a lot of the electronic uh, analog snares are out there. Lay back on. And, uh, like I said, there's a lot of effects on the snare, and that's okay. So that's our snare drum and our kick drum. Um, the next sounds are the narwhal. Um, the narwhal is a symbol. It's a uh, I think a really, really good sounding analog symbol. Now, for those of you who've watched these in the past, um, typically when I patch in a like a hi-hat sound, I take a noise into a high-pass filter and then through a VCA and I trigger it with a, uh, a function generator so that I can change the gate length give it a little bit of a dynamic 
And that sounds interesting um, because it doesn't use a million modules when you're trying, excuse me, when all you want is a hi-hat. Uh, this one goes way further. It's a completely different thing. Um, really complex and hopefully it sounds like a symbol because like again like the kick in the snare that's really what we were trying to do here is we wanted a drum that sounded like the drum it's representing so this will be this I have two of them in here they're both tuned a little bit differently so let's listen to this first one here yeah that sounds really nice we can change tuning or am I listening to the right one here no no I'm not oh yeah, yeah. okay you can change the material so this would be the type of metal that the symbols made out of some of these you got to go with you sort of have to suspend reality to, to go with them but that's okay it's fun And then we have density in a switch. If you want a nice little something a little smaller. There's the density. It does sound a lot fuller with that on, but sometimes you just want a little blip. So you get that too. Then you have a high pass filter. This high pass filter is a little bit resonant, um, but it's a, the resonance is static. It's not adjustable. We just sort of set it where we thought it sounded nice and uh, stuck a resistor there. And then obviously decay. And then you have an attenuating voltage or attenuating CV over the decay if you want. That's the first symbol here. Then we have the second one. And just sort of play it off each other a little bit. Let me see what I have. So we have two more drum sounds they're, again they're the same thing it's the cardinal i don't know if i've shown this one yet i don't know if i've shown the narwhal yet either uh, it's been a while since i've done a live stream i have a lot of new stuff so um again these are all sort of prototypes but a lot of them like the kick and the snare some of these other modules are already finished production just sort of waiting to go out um the cardinal is more of a general purpose drum. Uh, we were calling it a tom for a while, but that's not really what it is. It's it's more of just a drum. You can it's it's wide uh, range. You can kind of tune it to do a lot of different things depending on what your purposes are. So I'll just turn on both of those. We'll see what we got here. That's the Cardinals doing their thing, adding to the beat. And that's just about it for the patch. Uh, there's one more sound, which is it's sort of just a, I, was, I didn't have enough room for any more sequencers. The bass is being played with the micro sequence here, which is under my head, under my head here. Um, I, but I only had one sequencer, so uh, the lead sound, so to speak, ends up being just a, a random um, sequence or random sound played by the gibbon. This sounds actually, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, it's. I wanted to use the rest of the modules, so 
the the lead sound ends up being probably way more complicated than it needed to be, but but that's okay. Let's talk about it because again, it has a couple modules in it that you probably haven't seen. The sound itself starts with the local parks oscillator, which is another one that I definitely haven't shown. Um, I just made a panel for it in the last couple days. This is another one. It's, you know, an acrylic panel with a paper behind it. This is a first prototype, although it's kind of right. So I don't, I don't think the production version is going to change at all. Uh, a really interesting oscillator. If you are, if you're an old school Pittsburgh modular, person and you remember way way back or if you've looked at our old modules at all um, we used to have a module called the generator and then there was an expander for it called the generator expander or the gen expander I think it was called and then we had a version that was both of the modules behind one panel called the generator X or the gen X I don't know uh, but the generator was interesting in that it could, it just created the most uh, fantastically angry square waves, but it didn't track and it was really a percussive oscillator for that reason. It was extremely atonal and it was basically two oscillators feeding off, feeding back into each other uh, to get these fantastic FM loops. You could get really nice zipper sounds out of it important zipper sounds are electronic music but it was a thing uh, so I always kind of wanted to dig into that again and say what can I do you know, obviously it has to track both per octave this time um, and what were the interesting aspects of the generator and how can we take those ideas and create something completely different. Um, this isn't. This has nothing to do uh, circuit-wise with the generator, but I think it captures the same spirit, and I think it's what it does is very interesting. So it's the same. Actually, it's the same oscillator core, the core core, as Captain Big O, which is right over here playing our bass, but. Beyond that uh, 2164 VCA core, everything that beyond that is is totally different. Um, we've added, we put, so it's it's really comes, you know, with all of the oscillators that we're doing now that are interesting or unique. Really, it's the wave shaping that's unique. Uh, our core hasn't really changed in a while because it works and I think it sounds good. It, you know, it creates a nice saw wave and from that we can shape it and it's stable. So this takes that saw wave we create with our core and creates some really interesting waves with it. Uh, we go back to the blade wave. We haven't used the blade wave in quite a while. I think the SV1 is the last, the last time we implemented the blade wave. Yeah. So I wanted to put, I wanted to use the blade wave, blade wave again. So I put a blade wave in here, uh, fully voltage controllable, and typically, in, and this is in the SV1 when we did it, we tied the pulse width of the square wave to the blade wave because it saved a knob. Uh, we certainly did it that way with the primary oscillator. Um, but this one, being the focus on square waves, uh, they're two totally different circuits. So the blade wave kind of stands alone in here. This does have an LFO built in, a modulation source, because all the stuff in here, you kind of really need it. So the LED you see is, that is the uh, LFO portion of it. But where this gets interesting is sort of this side and with the switches. We have an octave switch, which bumps the oscillator up one octave or down one octave, which is something I've wanted for a while. You know, in our in the 
the voltage lab had it, the microvolt had it, it had an octave up and an octave down tied to the MIDI. And I found that super useful, especially since, you know, we use pots for the course and fine tune. It's hard to switch, you know, if you want to throw it up an octave or down an octave, it's hard to do that. So this has a, uh, an analog switch switching the octave up and down, which, you know, it's not, it's not revolutionary, but it's super, super handy. Um, so now moving over here, we have a pulse width for our pulse wave. It goes from 0% to 50%. And then above that, we have pulse shift. Um, I don't have a, I don't have an oscilloscope set up tonight to show you what pulse shift looks like on a scope, but uh, it takes a square wave and turns it into a staircase. It adds a step. So, um, you know, if you think like up, down, like that, that's your square wave. This would be up, over, down, step, kind of like that, um, if that makes any sense. But what it does is it, it shapes that waveform and it gives you some interesting harmonics. very very cool it's an idea that we expand on in the voltage lab too quite a bit the pulse core also the pulse wave also has a switchable core so you can switch between the waveform that we're using to create the pulse wave you can switch it from a saw to a sign and the reason why you would want to do that is it sounds different One's going to be a little bit smoother, and one's a little bit harsher and squarier. And then over here we have a binary switch. Now what the binary switch, and there's a binary output as well. What that is, is that, and I think I can switch, I can switch to that. You can probably hear the, hear the difference. What the binary is, it is a... analog binary ring modulator. So it's using sort of a, we're running analog square waves through a uh, CMOS ring modulator circuit that we created. And it just gives us nice and clangy sounds. It's actually something that we used up here in the narwhal for the cymbals. And I thought it was interesting enough that uh, I wanted to put it in the oscillator. So it's in here as well. And that's nice. If you want to use this for percussive sounds, um, it does a really nice job of that. It's, it, when you're do, using it in ring mod mode, it doesn't really, you know, anytime you're using a ring mod, you're not really going to track volt per octave at that point, but you have very interesting percussive sounds coming out of it, which is cool. And again, I know this isn't a great demo to show exactly how this sounds and all the millions of features are in it. It's not really the point of tonight. The point of tonight is just sort of give you an overview of the patch. And that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so anyway, the output of that is the pulse wave output of that is going into the binary filter here. We're taking the low pass out of the binary filter and we're going into the wolf. And the wolf is a uh, your rack channel strip. And what it has is it has an overdrive at the beginning here. You can see we're really pushing it. So we can bring that back. So we have a overdrive circuit and you can get clean it'll certainly do clean it's happy to do clean and then you have a high and a or I'm sorry a high shelf filter 12 and a half K and then a mid and a low parametric EQ 
that I think sounds really, really, really good. Just adds something to the sound that even neutral, everything sounds a little bit more analog coming out of it. Like the Occupy Mixer, it just, it sounds better. It makes things sound better, which was the whole idea with this module is it's a, it's sort of the end of chain module that makes your sound fuller, better. Um, this has a VCA into it as well, and that's what's turning on and off the local parks. If I just let it drone on, this is what we get. <laughs> so that's doing that. And then that's the uh, VCA is being triggered by the mod tools here. I'm using the, the function generator at the top with, again, with the gate from the gibbon. The pitch from the gibbon is changing the pitch of the local parks. Yotus asks if the wolf is what the channel strip driver ended up as. Yes. Yes, it did. I, the channel strip driver was the first sort of idea of using that EQ circuit in something. Um, the, the overdrive and the channel driver module was a lot stronger than we ended up going with. We, I just wanted something that added some weight to it where the channel driver just pummeled you down and it really became sort of a one trick pony at that point instead of uh, something that you could use everywhere. So it's it's a little mellower and the channel driver didn't have a VCA built in, it was just an EQ. This has a VCA at the end so you can, uh, it makes sense to use it in every patch and it kind of earns its HP which is something that I, I try to think about a lot is you know, as I'm designing some, does it, is this worth the amount of space that it's going to need? And I think once we put the VCA in, it's like, oh yeah, that, that's what that module was supposed to be the whole time. So that's, um, that's the signal path of this thing. I think I covered everything. We can talk about... we go back to another nice thing about the Okapi is it not only does each channel have a mute slash inverter switch but you have a output mute as well so you can mute all the channels at once Super handy. So let's go back to the bass drum here, or the, or the bass sound here. Get rid of all the effects. This is the big O, it's the saw going into the filter of crows, into the dynamics bat, and then into channel three over here. Um, let's talk about the filter of crows for just a minute. This is a module that, again, is one of the modules that is, the production is done, it's just sort of sitting at the shop, um, and should be available in a couple, probably three weeks or four weeks, I don't know. We're gonna do the, we're gonna do the kick and the snare, the, the uh, llama and the polar bear first and it's sort of as soon as things calm down we're going to do the other three that we have um but five all at once is just i think it's too crazy there's no reason to do it so we're going to hold on to these three for a couple weeks 
till the till we have a minute. But the filter across, let's talk about it. So what makes this interesting from say a binary filter, which I put right next to it uh, for just this reason. They have essentially the same sound um, to, a, to a point. Um, a filter of crows is kind of both a binary filter and crow filter. So if you're familiar with the when we did the limited edition crow filter, it was the idea with the crow filter was just overdrive, overdrive, overdrive into the filter. And it sounded great, but it's all overdrive all the time. So I wanted a way to kind of say, you know what? Sometimes you don't want all that. Um, and I thought, well, let's do, and, and a lot of people were asking us for, to do another round of crows. And I don't want to do, because the idea of these modules is really to experiment and try new things, I don't want to do another round of anything. So, but I thought, fair enough, let's, let's iterate on crows and on the crow and let's see what we can do interesting. And so a filter of crows is kind of like the binary filter and crow put together where you have your beautiful binary filter sound. Uh, we did add switches for all the cutoffs. So you can have high pass band pass and low pass. You can have them all at once if you want. Um, but it's very easy to have low and band pass or high and band pass or high and low or just low. You know, I've been playing with low. I do dig how low and band pass sound together. We have our um, stable switch. So stability. Right now it's in stable. We can change that. get crazy with it and then we have our drive then the drive is the overdrive from the crow but now we can add the stability from the binary filter, and we can add those two things together to really push the thing. Just get it to sound super nice. And right now, what we're just sending is a saw wave, and it just sounds massive. Very, very nice. Do I have prices on the new stuff yet? Not tonight. I don't. No. All that stuff, it'll all be announced. The kick in the snare will be announced next week, and the prices will be set then. Um, and everything, you know, when it comes out. So we have our filter of crows then going into the dynamics controller bat. And this is a. Uh, This is acting as the envelope and the VCA, although it's in low pass gate mode. If we just let it pass through. Now we're adding resonance from the dynamics control bat because it's a resonant low pass gate. the next version of the voltage lab low pass gate we have we tweaked it um and sort of fixed a couple of little things that we thought could be a little bit better and now we have two, instead of the three modes in the old one uh, which were vca filter and low pass gate this one just has two has vca and low pass gate those are the interesting ones um 
but what that allowed us to do is tune it in a way that they all sound as absolutely good as they can. Um, there's, we didn't have to compromise to make the filter and the low pass gate versions work. Uh, when in reality, this is the this is the sound that people wanted. Um, certainly the sound that I wanted. So we thought, let's focus on that one sound and make it great. But you still have the clean VCA if you just want a VCA. Which in this patch, because there's no envelope patched in, kind of sounds a little weird, but we'll go back into low pass gate mode here. Maxwell Ward asks, would we ever consider open sourcing our discontinued products and or allowing a VCV rack VST or is that sacrilege? It's not sacrilege. Um, we don't really have anything that would work as a VST, I don't think. You know, we don't have anything that's code. Um, we have open sourced a couple modules. Um, what I found with that is I just don't have time to do it. Uh, I don't, you know, some of our older designs, yeah, absolutely, but I just <laughs> I don't have time to document the stuff and put it out there, so it, it ends up not happening. I had a whole list of modules we were going to do that with, and I think I ended up doing two uh, before I got sidetracked. <laughs> so that's, um, that's about as far as that went, but I'm not against it. I think it's all great, and if... You know, if someone wanted to do a VST version of our analog thing, yeah, awesome. Um, oh, here's another cool thing. I don't know if I can... See if I can get the camera to see them. Uh, no, focus. There we go. Noodles. Oh my god. How long has it been since we've had patch cables? Nasca. Noodles. These are awesome. In fact, hold on one second. So soon, I've got some purple ones in the patch up here. Soon, we will have more noodles. And by soon, I mean in a couple weeks. As you can, as you can see, <laughs> I have them. They exist. What is Nazca anyway? Bill, we named the we named them after the uh, Nazca lines. There was a point where um, we found uh, ancient aliens endlessly entertaining, and uh, that's, that's not the best story, but that's that's where they got named. New noodles come in seven colors, I think, and way more sizes than they used to. I want to say six or seven different sizes from 
short guys, short guys like this to uh, 300 millimeters, which is absurdly long. Um, we have, yeah, light blue, pink, black, purple. It's a bunch. That's a thing that took <laughs> so much longer than we thought it was going to take. Um, so much longer, but the end result was good. The end result is great cables that now we can have in stock all the time. And a lot of what we're doing nowadays and why things are taking so long is we're sort of switching from the idea of producing um, a couple of you know, whatever it would be, say voltage labs, instead of making a couple voltage labs and being like, well, that's all we're gonna do. Um, we're, we've spent the last couple years sort of starting over and saying, okay, how can we do this manufacturing side properly and make a lot of things consistently uh, available to everybody all the time? Uh, and that's what we've been doing for the past few years. And that's why you haven't seen any synthesizers from us because uh, switching to that type of production is um, way way more difficult than I thought it was going to be. But ultimately, it'll be it'll be worth it. Uh, but what that allowed us to do then is to do the you know the Safari modules and the, the like the the local florist and the local parks here. Um, these limited edition modules where we can sort of test ideas and not have to worry about is this module cool enough that we can sell it for the next three or four years? It doesn't matter. You know, we're going to make 200 and we think it's awesome and I'm sure we have 200 other people out there that dig them and that's all that matters and then we'll go and do something else. So we're kind of creating these two different product mentalities. The modules that are sort of here it is, up oh, it's gone, and the synthesizers, which are here's the synthesizer. You know, we spent three years working on this thing, um, and let's make sure everyone can get one, and it's around for a long time. So we're sort of tackling both both sides, but it's it's been uh, it's been quite a couple years. make you an SV-1B black box. Um, I don't do that. That would be Perry. Um, Perry, we do have a few black box, well, we do have a few SV-1Bs certainly left. Um, and I think Perry's been making black boxes per request for them. Uh, he's been putting them in the store randomly and they don't tend to last very long. Um, but we try to keep you know, if, if something's available to purchase in the store, it's because we have one sitting on the shelf. And the SV-1B is kind of one of those things where it's the last of them. So as Perry builds them up and tests them, um, they go into the store and then that's it. There, there wasn't very many left and there's a, a very small number of them left now. And kind of once they're gone, they're gone. And that's okay. <laughs> uh, Chase the Violet Sun wants to know any VL2 updates. Um, no. Yeah, maybe. It's coming along. I fully expect it to ship in 2022. Uh, like everything else, we're kind of counting on being able to get the chips. It uses um, four or five chips that have been increasingly hard to come by. So as soon as we can find those chips, um, if we can find them, it'll go into production. If not, you know, we're gonna have, to, it'll be waiting. Um, it kind of is what it is. I can't wait to show it to you guys though. It's gonna be beautiful. Um, before, Voltage Lab 2 comes out though, 
we do have another instrument uh, coming out before that which should be very cool uh, the the voltage lab 2 does come in a case you won't need a you won't need a special skiff for it or anything it comes in a what is an absolutely beautiful case it's totally different than the original voltage lab uh, there may be one or two sort of inspirations from the original voltage lab visually uh, but it really we took the time to make it exactly how it should be and it's it's a lot bigger than the original voltage lab as well uh, the original voltage lab was 48 hp wide the voltage lab 2 is 90 so it's a 90 hp synth module and a 90 hp controller module now i understand we're sort of stretching the limits of your rack when we're making 90 hp modules but honestly it wasn't really designed to be a your rack module like it can't you know you can take it out and put it in a case if you want um, but it's not going to be sold that way you're going to have to get it in the case um, and it once you see it you understand why it's it's gorgeous and the 90 hp allowed us the room to do uh, exactly what we wanted to do and, and, and make sure that it was exactly the instrument we wanted with the features that we wanted to share um, it is truly a, a unique curated experience <laughs> yeah there's a mystery instrument it, um, I'm not allowed to talk about it there's, a, there's actually we have before the voltage lab 2 we have uh, there's one Pittsburgh instrument but then there's I did a bunch of stuff for create that'll be coming out as well and, and I think that stuff will be coming out you'll see I think you'll see something at super booth and you'll see something at NAM from create uh, that I designed for them that are standalone instruments that are awesome and they're super fun they sound amazing um, but I'm, create hates it when I talk about stuff so I'm not gonna talk about that I'll just talk about the Pittsburgh stuff hey Christopher Geisler good to see you here yes does anybody have any questions about the patch or I kind of assumed that this live stream would devolve from this into just sort of an updated chatting about what's going on and that's okay we can do we can keep talking about that um, but if you have any questions about the patch or you want me to you know feel like we've been listening to this for a while we can play around with it a little bit see what we can get <laughs> no I don't think the uh, 90 HP is gonna bend it's not gonna fit it's not rack mountable at all not an option it's too wide too wide fuzz of the module it's driving me crazy there we go now oh, this is the uh, 2 plus 2 hookah pie there's actually two versions of the this mixer uh, the question was what's this mixer called again on the top right it's the 2 plus 2 hookah pie it's inspired by our Pittsburgh module 2 plus 2 mixer the life forms 2 plus 2 uh, this one however has mute switches, invert switches, if you want to invert it, the signal, um, also has a meter, a three LED meter per channel, which the circuits to do the, the circuits to do the meters is probably larger than the circuitry for the mixer, but it was absolutely, once we put them on there, we're looking at the, just even the drawing of it, we're like, oh, that's, Every mixer needs to have all the meters now. It's 
you can't do it without it. So we fell in love with the, it's just so absurd that we fell in love with it. Um, so they have mute switches, the meter, and then you have uh, an output for one plus two, and then that's normal to the full mixer, which again has a, a main mute, so you mute all the channels at once. You have a clean out. clean sound but you also have that saturation circuit which is going to add some a little bit of uh, like compression um, a little bit of saturation to it just to pull everything together sort of like a glue um, it doesn't it never presses too hard you can get it almost into it like a mild overdrive sound but you really have to push it to do that the point really was just to glue the signals to glue the sounds coming in together um, make everything better coming out than it was going in it was you know i talk about that i talked about that with the wolf as well but that's really the idea make it sound better coming out than it did when it went in um the saturation circuit only works with audio but if you wanted to use this for CV, you absolutely could. You just have to do it in, you just have to switch to clean um, and you can patch CV through it. Not a problem. There's actually, and I said this earlier briefly, but there's actually two versions of this mixer. Um, they both have the same name because we wanted to make it wildly confusing. So we thought that was funny, or I thought it was funny, certainly. Um, so there's the two plus two occupy, and then there's the stereo occupy and what that one has is instead of the mute switches it has pan pots so you have your four channels and then you have a left right pan it does not have a mute but you have the left right pan and um, it does have the saturation as well and it does have the clean mode and the main mute so you can mute all the channels um, but the individual channels because it's only 8hp there's not enough room for both the switch and the pan pot so uh, we swapped out the switch for the pan pot it's called the stereo occupy has the exact same panel although it says stereo at the top um, same graphic same animal again i like the idea of having the look exactly the same except for a little tiny bit of text at the top I thought it was entertaining <laughs> but this is it's it's a nice sound I think it sounds really nice sort of uh, inspired by the wolf although the wolf uses a different type of saturation circuit uh, the wolf is that circuit is really sort of a milder version of the circuit we used in the crow oh, Danielle texted me to say I'm saying it wrong oh Kepi sorry hopefully I didn't defend um Poor little animals. <laughs> yeah, so all the, like the, the uh, llama and the polar bear, uh, we did 200 of each of those. Filter of crows, we did 200, 200 wolves. We did 250 bats. Uh, because I thought there might be a little bit more interest in that and we wanted a bunch more so I was like well I need four of those and so it was one of those things where it's like we better make a couple more because once we take what we want um, we still want to have 200 to go around or 230 240 to go around uh, we're trying to trying to make the uh, the whole experience a little more fun as well oh clay's asking is there a plan for all these percussion modules to be a part of a single system yeah of course 
we wouldn't go to the all because again uh the safari stuff is all it's it, they're all experiments um they're all us testing circuits and trying things out to use in synthesizers so obviously if we spent you know nine months designing a bunch of percussion sounds there's a reason we did that um, what that reason is you'll find out in probably a year and a half because it's uh and that's another reason why we're doing this stuff because it takes so long now it it takes so long to get um the the sort of mass produced stuff made that we're excited about it now <laughs> so we want to you know we want to do it we want to get it out there now we want people to hear it now we want to play with it now so it really is a way for us to get it out there because we're ex we're excited about this stuff um but yeah of course there's a there's a drum machine coming down the road and i promise you because the, the design of it's done and uh it's it's now going into prototyping um it's not like any drum machine you've ever seen it's it's an extremely pittsburgh style drum machine um i'm i'm infinitely proud of it and uh, but like i said it's it's a year and a half away really from getting out there i would like to hope it was less but it's not it's not how it works unfortunately Yonis asks, what's the bat again? The bat's a dynamics controller, so it's a low pass, it's our low pass gate from the voltage lab. Uh, the low pass gate without the Vactrol in it, we've, you know, we've re-engineered the Vactrol, uh, sort of an analog circuitry clone of the Vactrol components. So we can, uh, we get that same response you get from a low pass gate, but we have, infinite control you know you can infinitely swap out vactrols if you want a real tight short vactrol or a long gummy vactrol then we can also voltage control that as well um with resonance but French fries. See, I think uh, French fries and there would have to be a giant, way too much uh, shredded cheddar cheese on it as well, I think. <laughs> um, but we are trying to, we're trying to make these Safari modules interesting and fun, not only for us because we want to use them, but uh, for you guys too. Um, so we're trying to do fun things that, like... Uh, the five that we have in the shop right now, um, when they ship, they're going to ship with each one is going to ship with a unique Polaroid, which uh, myself and Ross have been trying to take as many Polaroid pictures as we can. Uh, when we came up with the idea of adding a Polaroid picture to every module box, we thought, wow, that was a great idea. That'll be fun. Um, and then you start to do the math and you realize, Oh shit, I need, in the next couple weeks, I need 1,200 Polaroids. We don't have 1,200 interesting things. So, um, but we're trying to make each one of them unique. We're also signing them uh, with sort of what it is and either my signature or whoever took the picture is signing it. And I've been, actually, the last couple of days, I've been starting to post them on Instagram because I find it, I found them fun. I, I, they're, they're really just meant to be fun because that's sort of what all this stuff is, is kind of meant to be. Um, they're going to come with, uh, the module's going to come with a magnet, like a fridge magnet of the thing that it is. So 
the llama will come with a llama fridge magnet and the polar bear will come with a polar bear fridge magnet uh, and the the magnets are the graphics from the panel so filter of crows will come with a crow um, the bat is on the dynamics controller and then you get the wolf so each one fridge magnet to put on your fridge and hold your uh, children's grades or pictures you know whatever you want to put on them that's up to you <laughs> oh and they also come um, each one and this is the first time we've done this they're gonna have serial numbers on them and you then get also a signed piece of paper by me like a little letter and it's hand signed by me and hand numbered by me and that little piece of paper will the number will match the number on the back of the module and um, yeah so we were trying to make it more fun because again these are sort of limited and we don't we want to sort of celebrate that and celebrate some of them are a little weirder than others um, some people are gonna like some more than others and that's great but they're all we're trying to make them interesting and fun Polaroids are, the idea of the Polaroids is they're going to replace the sci-fi cards. Which, I think we've purchased the world's supply of those sci-fi cards at this point. They're getting harder and harder to find, so we thought, well, let's make our own. Yeah, we for a long time we've used the Berkey cards, and they're just, they're harder and harder to get. Llama kick is actually based off of the, that kick sound from the Pittsburgh Low Pass Gate. Um, but we were able to sort of hyper specialize it and pull out bits that to give it a little bit more range. If you've ever done the patch with the Low Pass Gate module to create that kick sound, you realize, oh, it sounds really good, but it really only makes that one sound. Um, it's not terribly flexible. So we, we started with that as the core, um, but we really cut out what we all the extra fluff that we didn't need and really focused it to make it interesting, give a little bit more range, hopefully a lot more range. I'm going to take, if I take the, so I took out the, the trigger for the hi-hat here, or one of the symbols, and I'm going to plug that into the sim, the, the snare, and this is into the CV input for the bottom head. So you can hear we're listening to both the top and the bottom head right now, but I'm going to patch this in, and this will trigger just the bottom head. I'm gonna turn just for a minute. I'll turn all the reverb sh shit off and the delay. So you can hear that extra percussion sound now. That's just sort of tapping on the bottom of the head. But you can still use the snare in the top head when you trigger through the input. So you get a really sort of an extra drum for free. Hey, 
Hey, thanks for hanging out, Yodas. Does the llama use physical modeling? No, it doesn't use, none of these use physical modeling. They're all analog, um, but they're inspired by real world instruments. So um, for a while I was kind of around the shop, I was calling it analog physical modeling, but it's really not, we're not, we're not saying, okay, now how do we, how do we model the, the tone of the wood or how do we, you know, it's, it's really, um, emulating physical objects or presenting a, an analog circuit that gives the impression of a physical object. Um, but there's, it's, it's not really the same thing as physical modeling. I don't know if you can hear the all the the hiss. That is the because I'm tonight I'm using two uh, Alesis MIDI verbs. I have a MIDI verb two and a MIDI verb three, and they're they're just they're noisy. What can you do? Also improved the uh, the Safari panels quite dramatically from the first round to the crow and the the gibbon and the giraffe. The new panels I think look really really good. I don't have one in here, but um, if you've seen the flamingo, that's a, a better representation of how the panels are going to look. David asks, which one is my favorite module? That's a great question. Um, I, I don't know. I think they're all, I'm having so much fun because they're all kind of new to me. I think they're all kind of great. Uh, the module I'm most proud of um, would probably be right now Even that's tough. I don't know. I've really been digging the high, the symbol modules, the narwhal. I've been playing with them quite a bit.
And to be honest, my favorite module is one that I'm not allowed to show you. Um, but these are all. Actually, the original Crow, the black on black was, I was so excited about that, and I think it turned out so well. And you're right, you can't read it unless the light is exactly perfect on it, but I got the biggest kick out of that. It made me so happy. <laughs> and again, that's something that we couldn't have done if, if we were putting these modules into production for a long time, you know, you, you can't possibly do that. Um, but if you're making a couple hundred or something, sure. Do a ridiculous black on black module. Um, and the Filter of Crows, the Dynamics Bat, and the Wolf, they all share the same color palettes. And actually, the Cappy as well, they are sort of inspired by the Crow, that the darker colors on black, except for these, I expanded a little bit so you can read them.
pretty fun patch. So snakes and the tiger are still, they're still on the way. I just have, I have to finish them. The, the hardware's done and there's, they're all at the shop, ready to ship. Panels are on, they've all been tested. Um, but I'm, I haven't signed off on the firmware yet. So they're just waiting for me to do that. But obviously, you know, I have three of the sequencers here, the snakes, working great um, I'm not sure what to do with the tiger the, the tiger is a little bit of a problem because it, it sounds great works great um, but we only have 60 and I don't want to upset anybody that really wants one so one of the reasons why we haven't put them out is that I'm not sure how to do it and not make people mad because there's literally 60 of them upset anybody 
But the good news is we have a ridiculous sequencer coming with the Voltage Lab 2. So if you missed Tiger, there's there's an even more ridiculous sequencer coming. Very quiet. Excellent. Good to hear. Another thing to mention, I don't know if it's even worth mentioning at this point, but obviously all the new modules come with our new knobs that I designed. So earlier someone asked me what my favorite module was. I think it's my knobs. I'm very proud of them. I think they're my favorite. Call Bill. The Cardinal actually has uh, the production version has three red knobs. So these three knobs are red on the production version. I just didn't I didn't have any of the the medium sized red knobs at my disposal right now. So I had to use white ones. But yeah, these are all red on the production one. The cool thing about the knobs is I can make them any color I want. I'm not limited to the four or five colors that the manufacturer sells them. So per module, um, I can just pick a Pantone color and make them that color.
Yeah, the drum machine's going to be interesting. I, I'm curious to get some feedback on when, when the time comes, because uh, working in the limitations of analog, if you say, okay, the whole thing is going to be, for the most part, analog, all the voicing is analog, um, you run into some interesting limitations in, in how we approached those and what we did to sort of make it, um, sort of turn those limitations into something that's really unique. Uh, I'm curious uh, what you guys are going to think about it. But that's a long time off. Long time. In the meantime, we've got the modules, and I think I'm taking them. We have no intention of trying to top the 808. This is it's, it's not going to happen. But we're going to have something that's really unique. It should be a lot of fun to use. Levon asks, did I see something called a dub mixer on Instagram? Like a dub style FX mixer system? Yes, you did. That's something um, a friend of mine asked me for if I would design something for him. And I said yes. And uh, later this year, you'll see this thing. It's bonkers. Um, it, not, not really. Uh, not really a. Uh, a mass product, a mass market Eurorack product, because it's really big, um, and it's you have to have a big system to take advantage of it. But if you do, it's cool, and that's sort of half of it. Uh, the dub style part of it's the top half. Uh, there's a more traditional um, mixer. If you think of. Uh, mixing console here if you think of this as a traditional mixer with you know channels and slater there's sort of a an insane version of this that goes with it so it's it's uh i think altogether it's like 
44 HP, but it's 252 HP. I think it might be 48, but it's big. Again, a friend of mine asked me, and I figured, yeah, that sounds awesome. discussion was sort of uh, a performance mixer and not like a DJ mixer but something where um, like effects become the perform you know performing effects becomes part of the performance um, and I, I think the way we tackled it is is interesting I don't, it's, it's certainly ambitious but that was an interesting module because it taught us a lot about this particular area of circuitry that we thought we knew really well and we've used for years and years. Um, but the amount of it in those two modules is absurd. Um, the amount of sort of what it is is we use like a, uh, well, they, they use an Arduino to control analog switches. So they, the analog signals go through these, they're routed around with analog switches. And we've used a couple here and there, and like something like the Cascading Delay Network used a bunch of analog switching to route the feedback, uh, but nothing like we've done with these things. They are complex on the back end. To do all the signal routing you need to do, um, you know, if you think of something like this, this has a, you know, a mix, which would be a mute. You could send it to the bus, or you can change the gain for some overdrive. Ooh, that sounds good. But now add more buses, um, EQs, submixes, just anything we can think of to aid in performance, things that I've wanted in this. Uh, we thought, well, if we can expand it, how many channels can we do? What type of uh, processing can we have built in? It's cool. The Gibbon is driving the local parks, and local parks is sort of the, the oscillator playing the, the lead. So if you think of... It's playing that part. Which is maybe a bit of a, a ridiculous part, but... It's definitely overdriven at this point. That's okay. So this is one of the cardinals. It kind of makes a nice kick drum on its own. It definitely gets... You can do that deep 808 style kicks.
snakes decided it was going to use its own clock. I just wonder what's going on. The clock. It was close, but not the same. Brainwashed by this, I agree with you. That's why we designed it, because we I didn't like the way analog snares sound. I think they sound small, and I think they sound weak most of the time. I wanted a big, beefy analog snare. Something that, you know, I grew up listening to, you know, in the, the late 80s when the snare drums were like, and I wanted something that made that sound. So that's, that's what we tried to do. the hardest module to work on. Um, well, I was talking earlier about that dub mixer. The, the dub module is really hard to work on because it's the signal paths behind the scenes are so confusing. And trying to decide if you have the code routing the analog signals properly or if there's an actual error in the schematic is it's been a it's been um, a lesson in patience but really most of the you know most of these modules came together really really well um, because these are sort of well like the the wolf and the crows and the bat the parks these were all based on or sort of expanded versions of things that I'd worked on in the past you know some things that I never released or some things that had been released but we should iterating on um, so I had a base for them so they're, they didn't take too too long um, the drums Michael did spend a long time working on the drums but by the time we get the circuits from Michael and then we kind of uh, tweak them and change them to for the for our purposes they're rock solid um, so they they weren't too too bad either um, the first version of this module the, the LEDs were upside down um, this module I put the the CV pots are oriented underneath they're oriented incorrectly for the, the knobs I want to use so you know little things like that but um, the hardest thing we ever did was probably the voltage lab that thing was a nightmare to tame the signal bleed because it was so dense uh, which is another reason why the voltage lab 2 is 90 HP because we wanted room for those signals to live without bleeding into each other um, Yeah, I, I, they're asking about the randomized variant accenting on the llama. Um, is that something I can say more about? I can. It's it's this top knob, the, the vibration knob. And what it is, secretly, between you and me and you, is it's an oscillator or an LFO. It's really an LFO. Uh, but what it's doing in sort of sub 12 o'clock is you're getting, it's mixing that signal in to the, like that would be the kind of audio input of the low pass gate. And if you want, you can even override it. And we could patch it into see something that's making a an audio rate signal, but in LFO mode, sort of sub twelve o'clock, what you're getting is that wobble is just sort of allowing it to be hit a little bit different. So each time, theoretically, it's not random. 
Um, it's just the frequency of the LFO, but because the frequency of the LFO is never in sync with the clock or with the triggers coming in, what you end up with is you hit it at different points of that LFO and you get a different sounding kick and you can, you can have less of that at slower frequencies or more of that. And then once you get past 12 o'clock, you can hear it becomes more of uh, you're setting the frequency of the kick drum. Exaggerated a bit. definitely patch in a noise sample and hold over that oscillator so I have I have one right here so this is the the sample and hold out which is normal to noise and this LFO is driving the frequency of it and you can hear it jump around but I think that's a little bit less interesting um, just because it's it's predictably different, <laughs> if that makes sense. Where, uh, and that might, you know, within the context of whatever you're doing with it, that may be exactly what you want. That's awesome. Um, but I, I prefer the idea of each kick sounds a little bit different. It just has a little bit, it adds a little bit of depth to the sound. Kibsit needs to sleep. Which one will be released first, and when can I expect these? The llama and the polar bear, the kick and the snare, will be available next week. Um, I'll do a live stream talking really specifically about those when it's time next week. Um, and then these three will be available sort of once we once it calms once these calm down. I have all five in the shop. So we're going to do these two first and then these three. Um, <laughs> so it, I'm guessing another three or four weeks and then we'll do these. It really comes down to how long it takes us to take a thousand Polaroids. Lottie wants to know what the local parks does. The local parks is an oscillator. It's a square wave focused sort of... Uh, it's interesting. It really deserves its own video, and I and I will um, once it you know it's closer. This is a prototype. Prototype. Uh, it's not hasn't entered production or anything yet. I just made the panel for it today. So, but it's it's an interesting interesting little oscillator, certainly.
tell the... I'll give you a quick on the look. I, I talked about it earlier in the video, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. Um, in maybe a way that's a little bit better than uh, the first time I went through it. Let's... Um, what we'll do is we will... We use the bass line here. Perfect. Let's, uh... Okay, so local parks. And what we have going on is it's a it's the the sort of Pittsburgh oscillator core. So it's the same core that's in Captain Bigo, uh, but really as soon as it leaves that core, it becomes a totally different thing. Um, it's, it all comes down to wave shaping. And all of our oscillators are really basically the same core. Um, it's just then we're kind of fascinated with all the different ways you can do wave shaping. So this is um, some newer interesting ideas. And I don't have an oscilloscope to show you in this this really needs an oscilloscope to, it, would, it becomes crystal clear when you see it, but um, you can see right now we're listening to a pulse wave, and we can go from zero to 50% pulse. You can also change the core. What the pulse wave core is, is what waveform we use to create the pulse wave. So you can switch between the saw, or you can switch between a sine. And it's you can see depending on where this top knob is you can get quite a bit of different sounds out of it with a different core now this top knob is what we call pulse shift this is unique to this oscillator and um, it's actually this bit is taken from the voltage lab too uh, but what it allows, it does is it creates a step. So full left here, you have a standard square wave oscillator. Uh, pulse. Great. But as we move this to the right, it creates, um, what I need is an audio visual tool here, which I don't have. Um, but it creates kind of a, a square wave would just be this. Um, this creates a step. So think of it as stairs down. It adds a middle step, and you can shift then where that middle step is to 50%. So you sort of slide the step down and then bring it up. And what you're doing is you're adding more harmonics in very interesting ways to give the... Pulse wave a different sound. So if we add a little bit of modulation, now there is a built in LFO, you can see it blinking away here. That's this knob. And if we go full left up here, this is your standard pulse wave, and now we can bring this in. So that's the pulse wave. We also have, um, over here we have an octave switch. Now this is something we've done in like the Voltage Lab and we did this in the Microvolt, but it was always done digitally with MIDI. Creating CV, we would just add an offset voltage to the, the MIDI out. This one's done analog, but it gives you octave up or octave down which I think is awesome because I always want that and you know because we use pots for coarse and fine tune it's hard to sometimes switch it up an octave so this is just a real fast way to do that simple we have the blade wave in this guy which we haven't used again he was in the voltage lab and the primary oscillator um, but I missed it so we've added it back to here modulate that. It's kind of nice. 
and then we have a binary output. And what the binary output is, is it is a ring modulator. binary because it's not it's a uh, it's a CMOS based ring mod so it's um, it's analog but it's digital it just works with square waves if you don't give it a square wave it, it doesn't doesn't hear it now we've amplified the input so that whatever you put in ends up a square wave um, but it I think it sounds nice and it was something that we hadn't done this is uh, the idea for this came from the narwhal where we used a, a similar concept but in narwhal it's sort of taken to the extremes for a symbol but I thought it made a nice wave shaper for just an oscillator and you can hear this is a, there's a lot of harmonics going on there I think it sounds nice Saw wave, triangle, there's a half sign, which is a half rectified side wave, so it's a sign on top and a square on the bottom, and then a sine wave. And then there's, you know, you have your, your pitch input, your FM, which is linear FM. Sync, CV for the LFO, so the LFO is CVable. Doesn't track volt per octave. Probably not at, not even close. Um, the blade CV, binary CV, so if you wanted to replace the LFO with another waveform into the ring mod you can or another oscillator into the ring mod you can do that and then I'll pulse with it so that's the local parks I decided I thought I would use local parks instead of um, instead of giving it a an animal just because we're also working on a uh, sort of the next local florist and that's the cascading florist so I thought well if we have the cascading florist then we should have a local something to go with it uh, so we're going to do the local parks into the cascading florist and those will sort of be uh, I don't have the cascading florist in here uh, but those will be sort of the next uh, round of things after we get through the mixers and we got a lot a lot of your rack modules coming a lot of but they I think the key is they all sound really good so I think that's it I've been uh, it's been over two hours I've been doing this I would like to thank everybody for sort of tuning in with me and uh, hanging out it's been awesome to do this again I've been so busy uh, I did talk to Herman. Herman is looking forward to doing uh, more live streams with me, and I'm sure he's excited to get his show back up and running. Uh, we had to put all that stuff on a hiatus for a short while uh, for reasons that I'm sure he'll get into the next time uh, he's live streaming. But uh, they are going to happen again. Um, we just, again, we had to take a break, uh, and, and I'm sure he'll tell you why. But I'll be back next week once the uh, the uh, llama and the polar bear are available. And we'll just sort of hang out and I'll, I'll run through it a bunch of times. And we'll go from there. Um, 
again, well, thanks everybody. And I will talk to you soon. I hope I had a blast. Thanks. It's so cool to see you guys again. I miss doing this. <laughs> All right. Bye everybody.